everybody. And uh, so since the beginning of genetics in the uh, uh, late 19th century, that there's been tension between two different kinds of views of inheritance, which we can think of as the Mendelian and biometric views. Um, so, of course, with uh, Mendel's work in the, um, in the 1800s, there was this discovery that you can have these individual loci that have act effectively as, uh, as switches with very discrete effects. Um, but, of course, at the same time, uh, there was uh, beginning to be work on studying uh, the inheritance of continuous traits. Um, so notably from Francis Galton, who was Charles Darwin's cousin. Um, he studied traits including height. So, so this plot is actually uh, uh, the, the first ever scatter plot that I know of. So it's showing basically the, um, the distribution of heights of, of children um, as a function of the heights of their parents. So he invented the uh, uh, statistical procedure of regression to, to study these data. And so when Mendel's work was rediscovered in 1900, it was really unclear how to resolve these different kinds of views of inheritance from the Mendelian school where they're really thinking of genetics as um, uh, a sort of discrete switch-like atomic behavior versus the biometric school, which is thinking of inheritance of uh, continuous phenotypes. And to a large extent, um, reconciliation came through R.F. Fisher's 1918 paper on the infinitesimal model. And there, the essential idea was that if you have a large number of loci that act in essentially a, a Mendelian kind of switch-like uh, manner, then uh, for any individual, you can count up the number of on switches they have and off switches they have. And if, if you assume that that determines a phenotype, then that can produce a continuous distribution of phenotypes in the population. And so, so after Fisher's work, um, I think it's fair to say that, that a lot of the, um, most of the major advances in genetics in the 20th century really came through um, reductionist approaches where people are thinking about genetics um, more in a Mendelian kind of a pro, uh, framework where they're thinking about the um, uh, sort of the, uh, the behavior of individual um, uh, genes um, producing phenotypes. And of course, with the, the advent of molecular work, there was a huge amount of work to, to understand the, the exact nature of the molecular links between a change in the genome and a change in phenotype. Um, and the uh, um, and, and the quantitative genetics, to, to some extent, was pushed to the side, except in, in fields like uh, animal breeding and plant breeding. Um, and so uh, in work that we were doing last year, I actually went back and started reading some of the literature from the 1990s to, to try to get an understanding of how people at that time were thinking about the number of loci that contribute to typical complex traits. And, and one paper that I um, came across that I think uh, sort of exemplifies this as a, as a paper that I had read at the time from one of my teachers in graduate school, Neil Risch, um, who, who was studying autism. And so I think that their thinking uh, is, is really uh, illuminating from a historical perspective. So they, they put together a, a study of autism with several hundred uh, affected SIP pairs. And uh, given what they knew about heritability of autism, uh, they, they, they predicted that if there were a modest number of loci that they should be able to get significant hits. In fact, they did not get any significant hits. And so Neil did quite careful analysis to uh, put a lower bound on the number of loci that must be contributing to the trait of autism. And so as you can see, he, he concluded that their results are most compatible with a model specifying a large number of loci, um, perhaps, perhaps even more than 15. And so I think this, this really highlights that um, up until the beginning of, of GWAS, people thought that even complex traits would be driven by um, relatively small numbers of loci. And, and presumably implicit in this is that these loci would, these genes would have um, sort of really direct and uh, understandable links to, to the disease that you're studying. Um, now, of course, in the last dozen years or so, um, genome-wide association mapping has, has really transformed our view of, of complex traits and, and their genetics. Um, and you know, I think this has really been revolutionary. Um, this is a, a plot from, uh, uh, I think, from the PGC, actually. This is uh, showing the Manhattan plot for um, the, the most recent meta-analysis for schizophrenia. Um, so I presume that many of you are authors on this paper. Um, so uh, this... This is a 
um, this, this illustrates the, the large number of hits that, that people get in well-powered genome-wide association studies, so 108 genome-wide significant loci in, uh, in, that were reported in this study. But perhaps even more remarkable than the, the really large number of loci that were identified there as genome-wide significant is that the significant loci themselves still only explain a small fraction of the total uh, genetic variance in, in risk. So, so, for example, a paper from Bogdan Pasaniok's lab a couple of years ago estimated that the, the genome-wide significant loci for schizophrenia are explaining about 10% of the uh, total um, variance in risk that, that can be attributed to common variation um, as detected in the study. So, um, the remainder of the variance is, due to, is driven by an enormous number of additional variants that um, are not significant in, in current uh, sample sizes. So, so there are, um, in, in other words, there's just an enormous number of additional loci with smaller effects. And together, these are responsible for the bulk of the risk in schizophrenia. So in today's presentation, what I want to argue to you is, is a couple of main points. First of all, that as I've alluded to, uh, for typical complex traits, most of the heritability is mediated, well, for typical complex traits, the heritability is spread very widely and thinly across the genome. And I'm going to argue that actually most of the heritability is mediated through genes that are not directly related to the trait of interest. Secondly, I'm going to argue that uh, we really need to think in the field about new conceptual models for the ways in which molecular processes link genetic variation to complex phenotypes. So, uh, you know, so if the, if the traditional way of thinking about genetics is in terms of understandable mechanisms that link gene X to, to phenotype Y, I would argue that complex traits don't really fit that model very well. And that we, we need new ways of, of understanding how it is that such a, an enormous number of variants across the genome um, can contribute to, uh, to the risk of, of disease or to the expected phenotype for a quantitative trait. Um, and so the work that I'm going to talk about today uh, was um, uh, largely uh, developed by um, two people in my lab, Evan Boyle, who's a, who's a graduate student, and Yang Lee, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. Um, and in the last part of the talk, I'll, I'll describe uh, additional newer work that we've done that's following on from the, the salt paper from last year. Okay, so... As I've suggested, one main rationale for doing gene mapping is this expectation that the, the signals we find can lead us to genes that, that play key roles in disease biology. Um, and certainly in some cases that, that's been true. There are um, now uh, quite a number of examples of, of genes that are top hits from GWAS studies where um, the molecular mechanisms have, have been identified. Um, so, for example, for the C4 genes in schizophrenia. And uh, there have also been studies that have looked at uh, gene set enrichment among the top hits from GWAS studies and identified gene sets that make sense. Um, so, so the, the, the figure here is um, a figure from um, the 2014 meta-analysis for height, and this identifies a number of uh, different kinds of gene sets that, that, that do make intuitive sense. However, I would um, I, so, so, so in this talk, I'm going to sh talk th you through a number of uh, observations about GWAS that we think are particularly pertinent. And the first is, as I su suggested, that, that for a lot of traits, the heritability is spread very, very widely across the genome. And I would argue that this suggests trouble for the expectation that the heritability is going to be concentrated into key pathways. So let's try to measure um, a bit better um, how, how many loci and how much of the genome contributes to complex traits. So first of all, there's been work from a number of labs that, that shows that the, uh, the loci contributing to heritability is spread very uh, thinly and uniformly across the genome. So uh, this is a plot, um, again, from Bogdan Pasaniuk's lab, Alcas Price's lab, some similar work, in which uh, they're, using, um, they're using a method to estimate how much of the heritability um, in schizophrenia can be assigned to each of the chromosomes. And what you can see here is each of the blue uh, lines represents a chromosome. They are ranked on the x-axis according to the number of SNPs on each chromosome, and on the y-axis according to the percent of heritability that's estimated to come from each of those chromosomes. And what you can see, of course, is that um, you can predict very uh, accurately how much heritability comes from each chromosome. 
that there's a little blip up here um, for, for chromosome 6, uh, which, which represents the, the uh, C4 signal, I believe. And, um, and so the fact that you can predict the, um, uh, the heritability from each chromosome so accurately given its length suggests that there must be a really large number of loci um, spread relatively uniformly across the genome, otherwise it would be much more noisy. And just to give you a, uh, an example of a, a trait that they found that looks quite different, um, here's rheumatoid arthritis, uh, where it's known that there are very important risk loci in the MHC region, so chromosome 6 looks quite different. But then the, the rest of the genome shows a relatively um, comparable polygenic signal. Um, so, so this tells us at the chromosome scale that the, uh, the heritability seems to be quite uh, widely uh, widely dispersed. Um, so let's try, can we drill down to look at finer scales to understand how much of the genome is contributing? Um, so uh, one way to ask this is how much of the genome is associated with the phenotypic variation for any given trait? Now, of course, this is actually quite a difficult question to answer because uh, what we really need to know is um, we're really asking a question about uh, the, the properties of variants that are not genome-wide significant. So, so we, what we need to do is develop methods that can, uh, that can use the, um, uh, that, that, can, that can learn about sub-significant signals. So one way that we have uh, taken to, uh, uh, one, one approach we've used to tackle this is to look at our ability to replicate signals from one study into another. And so I'm going to start by showing you results for height. And what we find in the example of height is actually most of the genome shows uh, replicable effects. So basically, um, in this analysis, what we've done is to take all of the SNPs um, in the, that were, uh, have, have a, um, uh, a measured um, effect. Sorry, we've taken all of the SNPs that were used in the giant study on height. So this is um, something like 200,000 individuals. And we've ranked the SNPs according to their association with height and giant from p-values near one. So these are, these are SNPs that are not significant at all to p-values near zero. So these are the genome-wide significant SNPs up here. And then um, each dot here represents a, a, a a bin of a thousand consecutive SNPs just to make it easier to see the overall trends. And what we're plotting on the y-axis here is the average effect size of SNPs in this bin in a replication data set, um, which is the Health and Retirement Survey, HRS. And uh, the, what we're doing is we're looking at what's the average amount of signal uh, where the effect size are polarized in HRS according to the direction that was observed in Giant. So if there were no replication at all, what we would see is that this blue line should uh, sit along the, the zero line here, and, and maybe it would tick up a little bit um, when we get to genome-wide significant variants. That's what one might uh, expect in a, in a model where um, only a small fraction of the genome contributes. But instead, what you can see is that actually most of the, a, a large fraction or essentially all of the um, SNPs of, uh, all of the p-value bins show some amount of, of signal of replication. So let's be quantitative about this. So for, among the genome-wide significant SNPs, the median effect size in the replication data set is about one and a half millimeters. Um, but more striking to us was that when we look at the median effect across all SNPs in the genome, the, uh, the median replication effect size is about one-tenth of that, so it's about 0.1 millimeters. And um, because there are relatively few genome-wide significant SNPs um, compared to all the SNPs in the genome, it turns, it, out, it turns out that actually most of the genetic variance in height in the population comes from this enormous number of SNPs with median effect sizes on the order of 0.1 millimeters. So it's been estimated that the genome-wide significant SNPs are contributing about 16% of the heritability, um, while the, the bulk of the heritability of, of height is coming from these. Okay, so, um, so the uh, next question is how many causal sites are there? And of course, um, uh, genetic variation in the genome is structured into haplotype blocks. Um, so uh, 
or that this is sort of a cartoon view of, of linkage to sequilibrium. So that if we have a single causal variant in one haplotype region, then this will generally drive a whole block of associations. So, um, so if, we, if we're asking about what fraction of SNPs in the genome show significant signals, then that's going to depend on the extent of LD. So um, one kind of thing that we've wanted, that we asked is, um, if we look at the distribution of p-values um, in, in uh, SNPs with different amounts of LD, then um, how does the amount of signal increase as a function of haplotype block size? Um, to be more precise, we use LD score, um, which is actually a, a sum of the, um, of the, of the weighted uh, strengths of LD um, between a target SNP and, and all of its partners. Okay, and then for every SNP, we're going to ask what frat, we're going to um, use a method from Matthew Stevens called ASHR to estimate what fraction of SNPs show an association, um, um, show, show, show a non-zero association with schizophrenia. And the way that this works basically is to, to model the data as being a, a mixture of test statistics that are drawn from a null distribution where there's, where there's no association at all, um, mixed with an additional distribution that's, that's got larger variance. So what we find is, is this. So when, when we look at um, uh, bins of SNPs that have very few LD partners, then the fraction of those SNPs that, uh, that we estimate to have non-zero associations is very low. But, but in, um, in, in SNPs that are in large haplotype blocks, then the fraction of those SNPs that, are, that show an association with schizophrenia is above 60%. And um, an averaging across SNPs, we estimate actually that um, about 57% of SNPs are linked to a variant that affects schizophrenia risk. So remarkably, uh, a really large fraction of the genome is close to a variant with a non-zero effect on schizophrenia, according to this analysis. And if you think that the typical signs of haplotype blocks in the genome is on the order of 10 KB, this suggests that um, uh, roughly half of, the, half of the 10 KB windows in the genome have an effect on schizophrenia. Um, and of course, most of these effects are very, very small, so um, they're well beyond our ability to map them at the present time. <clears throat> okay, so for height, um, our analysis shows that there are more than 100,000 causal variants, um, and uh, and again, that most haplotype blocks in the genome contain variation affecting height. We haven't done exactly the same analysis for schizophrenia yet, but the, uh, the numbers are going to be uh, similar. <clears throat> so, okay, so that's one observation um, about complex traits. The second observation uh, is that, that many groups have shown that uh, GWAS signals tend to be enriched in chromatin that is active in cell types that, that make sense um, in terms of what we know about the etiology of disease. But what we have found is that actually surprisingly, perhaps it doesn't seem to matter very much whether the chromatin that the SNPs sit in is, is broadly active or active only in relevant cell types. And by broadly active, I mean, uh, for example, chromatin that is present in, that is active in housekeeping genes, so it is active in, um, in essentially every single tissue of the body. So, um, so, so first of all, let me just convince you that heritability tends to be highly enriched in active chromatin um, for cell types that make sense. So, so there, are many, there are many groups that have done this kind of analysis. Um, this is a plot from a paper uh, by Alcus Price's group. And, um, and so, so each of these plots shows the enrichment of, of heritability in chromatin is active in, in different uh, cell types. And, and so the, each, each plot is for a different trait. So what you can see here is that bipolar disorder shows significant enrichment um, in, uh, among SNPs that are in chromatin that, that's marked as active in CNS tissues. Um, height, they pulled out connective tissues. Fasting glucose, they pulled out pancreas. And, and so forth. So, so this really shows that there, there is a clear connection between, uh, between the, the SNPs that show signal in uh, genome-wide association studies and um, regions that are involved in gene regulation and, and tissues that, that, that kind of make sense to us. Okay, now one uh, natural interpretation of that would be that these chromatin regions are identifying regions of the uh, regions that have um, important and tissue specific activities in those cell types. So for example, if we think about um, 
for example, uh, schizophrenia, then we might think of genes that play important roles in, in the synapse. And then you might imagine that there would be chromatin that is uh, playing important regulatory roles in, in turning those genes on in the right cell types. And so you might expect to see that they would, that, um, that these chromatin regions would, would be uniquely active in relevant cell types and that those would show particular enrichment um, in, in the GWAS signal. And what we, um, what we find, however, is that actually um, that there isn't very strong enrichment for, for most traits that we've looked at in, uh, in uniquely active chromatin in the most relevant cell types. So, um, so one way that we have looked at this is, is again using the, uh, uh, the stratified LD score analysis, which Arcus Price, this group, and Hilary Finucane have developed. Um, and what we're showing here is the PERSNIP heritability for three different diseases, uh, schizophrenia, rheumatoid arthritis, and Crohn's disease. And uh, for each of these, um, we've uh, determined what the, uh, the most associated cell type is um, for, for that disease. So it, it's brain tissue for schizophrenia and immune uh, cells for RA and Crohn's disease. And then for each of those uh, tissue types, we've classified the chromatin as either being uniquely active um, in, in cell types uh, within, that, uh, 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 within that tissue type, um, uh, somewhat specific or, or broadly specific. And broadly specific here means that the chromatin is, is, uh, is active chromatin in most or all tissues in the body. And what you can see is that um, the uh, on, the, on this plot, we're showing the, um, the, the enrichment of heritability on a per SNP basis for SNPs that sit in, in the relevant chromatin types. And you can see here that, that there, there may be a, a weak enrichment of, uh, a weak extra enrichment of, of signal in uniquely active chromatin, but it's actually very small and, and it's not actually significantly different from what we see in broadly active chromatin. So, so this argues against the notion that there's really uh, a strong signal of heritability coming from chromatin that has um, tissue-specific activity as opposed to um, being broadly active uh, in that cell type as well as possibly in other cell types as well. Now, of course, there's an important negative control here, which is to look at the heritability of, of SNPs that lie in, that lie in uh, chromatin that's active in other tissues, or, um, uh, or not active at all. And what we find for all three diseases is that um, in, indeed, uh, as, as we might hope, there's actually very little signal of heritability um, in, in active chromatin from, uh, from other tissues. So this is really an important negative control here. Okay, so a third observation that we think is important is that when we look at enrichment analysis of, of rare variants or, or strongest hits, um, it's been shown uh, by a number of groups, including uh, uh, PGC group for, for schizophrenia, that, that these kinds of analyses often identify core genes of pathways. Um, but uh, when we look at the heritability broadly, uh, we find that it's, it's spread very widely across the uh, the, the genome and the, the enrichment of, um, of, of pathways is very small. So the main predictor of heritability is simply that the genes have to be expressed in, um, in the right tissues. So we've looked at this in a number of ways, um, but I'll just show you one of these um, again for schizophrenia. So, so we, took, uh, we took gene sets and then uh, each gene set is represented by a, a single dot on this plot. Um, the the x-axis shows the uh, the fraction of all SNPs that are um, that lie inside or close to, to genes in that gene set, and then the y-axis here shows the proportion of heritability that we um, uh, that LD score regression assigns to that um, uh, to that gene set. And so what you can see first of all is that there's an extremely strong relationship simply between the number of SNPs in each gene set and the amount of heritability that we assign to it. Um, however, there are weak enrichments. So, so basically, you can think of the distance off the diagonal as representing the amount of enrichment. Um, so, so for schizophrenia, we, we do see some signals that, that perhaps make sense. So, for example, in, 
uh, genes involved in ion channel activity or calcium ion transport. Um, but the, overall, the, the biggest single contributor is protein binding genes, which, which seems like a relatively generic category. Um, and, and the main reason that's such an important contributor is just that it's, it's a very large gene set. Um, similarly, if we look at Crohn's disease, we see um, much the same overall pattern, although the gene sets that lie far off the diagonal um, have, have changed to some extent. So we see immune response and inflammatory response gene sets um, being relatively enriched, while ion channel activity is, is uh, relatively de-enriched. Um, but the, the main what I would argue is that the main take home message here is that we, we don't see enormous enrichments within gene sets that, that make sense, that the enrichments are relatively modest. And the main prediction of how much a particular gene set contributes to heritability is simply the, the, the number of genes or the number of SNPs that lie in that gene set. Okay, so, so those are the three, three main observations that, that we've made. And I think that this really raises uh, a core, a key question. So why does so much of the genome contribute to any given complex trait? And again, I argue that these kinds of observations don't really fit very well with our usual way of thinking about models of genetics in which uh, we could imagine that a graduate student goes into the lab with, with, this, uh, with this gene that's got a, an important association to a phenotype, and five years later they come out of the lab with a clear model for the mechanism that connects that gene to its effect on the phenotype. And of course there are examples of this uh, even in complex trait genetics, but I would argue the fact that if most of the genome is implicated, it suggests that most of the genome can't be acting through uh, direct and, uh, and easily understandable mechanistic links. Okay, so just to recap, for uh, quite a wide variety of traits and diseases, I think it's fair to say we have the following observations. First of all, the genes with trait relevant functions only contribute a small fraction of total disease risk. The heritability tends to be spread very widely across the genome. Um, for, I haven't talked about this in detail, but from a number of studies, it, it's apparent that low frequency and large effect variants tend to show clearer enrichment in relevant gene sets than, um, than common variants of small effect, um, even though these, these contribute only a small fraction of total heritability. Um, and then lastly, uh, the contrib contributing variants tend to be highly concentrated in regions that are active chromatin in relevant tissues. Um, and just as an aside, this implies that the most of the heritability um, is for, for typical traits is, is mediated through gene regulation. Okay, so uh, one thing that we wanted to do in our um, our review paper on this last year was to try to develop a, a model, perhaps even a straw man model to describe these data. So we refer to this as, as the omnigenic model. So we suggested that we can think about um, the genes in the genome um, with respect to some disease in, in three different categories. The first of all, the first of these we refer to as core genes. And these are genes that have direct roles in disease. And so um, heuristically, you can think of these as being the kinds of genes where a graduate student who goes into the lab for five years can, and can actually develop some really clear, understandable mechanism um, by which the, the core gene uh, affects the disease. So, so, for example, we might think of, of genes that are involved in, um, in inflammation or, or lipid metabolism for coronary artery disease, or perhaps genes that are involved in, in synaptic growth and development for, for schizophrenia. Um, and uh, we, we have a lot of thoughts on definitions of core genes. We can talk about this at the end if, if, you, if you want to cover that more. Uh, the second set of genes are what we refer to as peripheral genes. And these are essentially all of the other genes that are expressed in relevant cell types. And what we argue is that these potentially affect the regulation of core genes as transregulators. And in fact, that a very, very large fraction of them do. Um, and that most of the heritability actually winds up coming through peripheral genes. The third set of tier, the third type of genes are genes that are not expressed in the right cell types. Um, and these uh, we, we expect don't contribute to heritability at all. And this is consistent with, with the GWAS data. Um, but I think it's an important point to make that most of the phenotypic variance is due to regulatory variation that comes through peripheral genes. Um, however, the biggest effects are often uh, seen near to core genes. So, so the top hits in GWAS studies are in many cases close to core genes, but only explain a small fraction of the variance uh, due to this property. 
Um, so one kind of question that we've had a lot is uh, what, what do we mean by omnigenic and how is this distinct from polygenic? And so, um, so the reason that we thought it was helpful to develop a new term is that I think that uh, in, the, in the community, different people use polygenic in, in a wide variety of different ways, so that it's, it's, a, it's an imprecise term. So, um, so some people might, might use the term polygenic if they think that there are uh, perhaps dozens of genes involved in a trait. Um, at the other extreme, there are studies that, that, that assume that, um, particularly statistical methods, assume that every SNP has a non-zero effect on the trait. And this, this is also considered polygenic. So when people use the term polygenic uh, without put further qualification, it's generally unclear exactly what they mean. So by omnigenic, we are meaning uh, something much more precise. Um, what we mean is that uh, every gene that's expressed in a relevant cell type is likely to affect the disease. Um, and we also, as part of this, we suggest a, a kind of conceptual model for, for how this may occur. So, so I think of omnigenic as, as being less extreme than the every SNP matters um, model of version of polygenic, but, but it's, it's in the uh, it's in the more polygenic end of, of this spectrum. Um, okay, so, so I suggested this division a minute ago between core genes that have a direct role on disease versus peripheral genes. Now, we may imagine in general that SNPs that uh, regulate or, or lie within core genes may generally have bigger effects than, uh, than peripheral genes. However, if we imagine that there's a modest number of core genes for any given trait, then, then it's clear that the total number of peripheral genes can easily outnumber the core genes by a very large margin. So let's suppose that there are core, 100 core genes for some disease, then uh, in, a, in a typical cell type that's expressing more than 10,000 genes, then we might expect that there are 100 peripheral genes for every core gene. And, and, and this, then the sheer number of peripheral genes we would suggest means that they, uh, they tend to dominate the phenotypic variants um, through weak effects that kind of ripple through gene regulatory networks in cells. So, okay, so that, that's kind of a cartoon version of this. Um, we can, to some extent, get uh, some, some uh, more detailed understanding of, um, of how peripheral and core genes may work from, from looking at uh, what's known about EQTL regulation. So imagine that we've got a core gene here. And so how does this core gene, um, how does variation in the neighborhood of this core gene affect uh, disease risk? Well, one, one way might be through missense mutations within the core gene, um, although generally it's believed that these make a relatively small contribution to heritability. Um, Additionally, we can have cis EQTLs. So these are, um, these are variants that lie within the, uh, the region of the core gene that have direct cis regulatory effects on expression. Um, so, so we're going to assume that, that these are, are um, often going to be key contributors to, to GWAS signals. And of course, there's a great deal of evidence that, that shows in many cases that that's the case. Now, additionally, of course, we may have many other genes in the genome that are also affecting the uh, regulation of the core gene as, as trans regulators. Um, and in general, trans regulators tend to have small effect sizes, so, so we actually know much less about these than we do about cis EQTLs. Um, one more point that I want to make on this is that um, the way that I'm talking about this uh, emphasizes mRNA expression because that's actually the thing that we know the most about. Um, but of course, it's, it's clear that um, there may be many other kinds of transregulation in, going on in cells. So for example, protein-protein uh, interactions, uh, post-translational modifications, uh, intercellular signaling, thing, things like this that affect regulation of core genes um, that, that we actually really don't know very much about um, the effects of variation on. So, uh, so anything that we know about the, so, so what we know about the effects of transregulation on, on mRNA levels is probably, if anything, an underestimate of the total effects, the total uh, accumulation of, of effects from uh, uh, transregulation of variation. Okay, um, and, and these, are, these trans genes we would think of as being peripheral genes in the context of the model. Okay, so, so one key question then is how much of the genetic variance in gene expression comes from cis versus trans effects? So 
So I spent some time uh, going back and, and reviewing the literature on this, and, and I found about, um, uh, about 10 different studies that have estimates of cis and trans um, uh, heritability, and a couple of these are from, from my lab. And uh, what you can see here is that the, these are studies uh, looking at, at a wide range of organisms uh, and a, a wide range of different tissues, as well as different kinds of platforms. Um, many of these have relatively small sample sizes, but some have larger sample sizes. Um, and across all of these studies, uh, what's, what's found is that the, the, the fraction of the heritability of gene expression that's determined by cis variation ranges from around 10% to around 40%. And, and the median here is somewhere around 30%. So overall, what this suggests is that about 70% of the variance in, of the heritable variance in gene expression is determined by trans effects and, and a much smaller fraction by cis effects. Now, um, this may be surprising perhaps because from EQTL mapping, what we, uh, what we tend to find are cis effects, and this is because the effect sizes on, uh, in cis tend to be much, much larger than they are in trans. Um, so, uh, so, so if we can add to this, this figure here, um, that the cis links tend to be about 30% of the heritability of mRNA expression, and, and the rest is coming from these trans effects. Okay, now, as I told you a moment ago, um, it's, it's well known that cis EQTL SNPs do tend to have much larger effects on expression than the trans EQTL SNPs do. Um, so this is a, uh, um, an analysis done by Chuan Yao Liu. Um, and uh, what, she, what she has done here is to take all of the genes on chromosome 22 and then uh, and then do cis EQTL mapping uh, for those genes. And, and the red dots show you the distribution of effect sizes uh, for, the, for the cis associations. Um, the scale here actually is the uh, absolute value of the z-scores, um, but you can think of this as being, um, <clears throat> uh, as being uh, proportional to the, the square root of the effect on, on variance in gene expression. Um, so, so cis associations tend to have relatively large effect sizes. She's also done trans mapping uh, in which she takes each of the genes on chromosome 22 and uh, tests for association with every other SNP um, anywhere in the genome. So this is uh, comparing against all chromosomes here in the, in the purple. And what you can see is that even the biggest effect sizes in trans are much, much smaller than anything we see in cis. And, um, and this, this difference is going to be even more dramatic when we when you consider that actually what matters for the effect of these on variants is proportional to z squared. So, um, so when you square the y-axis, the, the, the orange dots are going to go so high up that it's actually going to be very difficult to see there's any trans signal at all. So if we put these two observations together, this implies that a typical gene must have huge numbers of weak trans regulators. So I told you that 70% of the variance is determined in trans, but that the cis associations are much bigger than trans. So there must be huge numbers of, of trans regulators of tiny effect for any typical gene. So if we assume for a, um, a for a typical complex trait like, like schizophrenia or other um, psychiatric conditions that there are probably tens of, at least tens or maybe hundreds of core genes, then this model uh, starts to explain why such a large fraction of the genome may contribute to any given complex trait. Because we can expect that, that any given core gene has got a huge number of weak trans regulators. So, um, so, this, so that observation starts to suggest how we might begin to bring in most of the, the genome as contributing to heritability. But I think there's one more key question that relates to this, and that is, um, why is it that the core genes actually contribute so little heritability to any given trait? So I showed you, for example, for, for schizophrenia, that the first 108 genome-wide significant loci and contributing only about 10% of the, uh, uh, the explained variance in, her in, in risk. And, and if we imagine that, that most of the, that, that many of the core genes may be among that set of 108, then, then it becomes clear that the, the core genes themselves are contributing only quite a, a small fraction of heritability. So this seems like another mystery. So to, to get at this, we, we started um, doing some, some mathematical modeling. I'm just going to sketch out the, uh, the simplest version of this, because I, I think it's quite illuminating. So imagine that we have a, um, a phenotype, a, com uh, a 
<laughs> continuous phenotype Y um, in individual I. Um, so, so you could think of this as, as being, of Y as being a trait like height, or it could, it could be some underlying cell state that's continuous that affects one's risk for a psychiatric condition. Okay, so now we're going to predict the, uh, uh, the value of the, the phenotype Y in, in any given individual as being um, given by uh, basically a, a kind of a regression model. So we have an average phenotype uh, in the population Y bar, and then next, we're going to do a sum over M core genes. Uh, so, so we assume that there are M core genes, and um, each of, and then the expression of each of these core genes has an effect on the phenotype um, that that is scaled by a, by an effect size gamma. So, the way to think about this now is that um, for uh, for an individual I, uh, a core gene X sub J. This, this individual I has some given expression level, Xij. Now, what we're going to do is we subtract off from Xij the, the mean expression of gene J in the population. And then we, and so this is giving us basically a measure of whether the individual is expressing gene J at a higher level than the mean in the population or at a lower level than the mean in the population. And now gamma is simply a, a um, a slope term that tells us how much a, a unit change in expression uh, changes the, the phenotype Y. And then lastly, we have a, a random error term that um, includes effects like, uh, like environmental and random effects. Okay, so now what we really care about is the, is the genetic contribution to the variance in the phenotype. Okay, so here's the, this is the uh, expression I just showed you a moment ago, but what we care about now is that the variance in the, in the phenotype Y. So we can compute the, the variance by, um, by computing the, the variance of this expression here. And this uh, com, uh, comprises, is comprised of, of a number of terms. So first, uh, we take the uh, a sum over the core genes of the variance in gene expression in each core gene times that, that effect size squared, um, plus a sum of covariances. So, so these covariance terms basically represent the, the covariance in expression between, e between every pair of core genes times a product of the slopes. And then there's an additional, um, uh, an additional variance term that, that comes from, uh, other, from, from the, the, the environmental effects. Okay, so now here's the, the key thing. So uh, the variance in expression here, this is what we were measuring a moment ago when we were looking at um, a gene expression. So I told you that about a third of this is determined in cis and about two thirds in trans. Um, uh, Work that we've done suggests suggest that the covariances tend to be dominated by trans effects, and we believe these come largely from peripheral genes. And now it turns out that there are m of these terms that affect the variance, and there are nearly m squared covariance terms. So what winds up happening in these models is that the, uh, the phenotypic variance uh, under certain conditions winds up being dominated by the, these covariance effects that come from large numbers of peripheral genes. Um, so, just to, to give you a, 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 a more of a cartoon version of how this looks, we imagine we've got some phenotype here. The phenotype is, is affected by a number of core genes. So, so one extreme version of this would be that the, uh, the core genes tend to uh, be regulated independently so that they don't have covariance in expression. And now under this model, what happens is that about um, if we assume that these for these core genes, about 30% of their expression variance comes in cis, and then about 70% of the expression variance comes in trans through peripheral genes, then because the, these core genes are in model one, I'm going to assume that they're regulated independently, if the covariance terms are zero, then this basically means that about 30% of the uh, phenotypic variance in this kind of model should come from variation that lies in cis to core genes. So this seems unreasonably high um, given our GWAS data. Um, conversely, if we have core genes that sit in co-regulated networks, then basically you can think of the co-regulated network as acting as an amplifier for, for the peripheral variation. So we've got cis effects that act independently on each core gene, so those go into the variance terms. Um, and then we've got these trans effects that are that 
um, uh, very often shared across the core genes. And so what happens is that in these kinds of models, most of the heritability for the trait actually gets transferred out of the uh, core genes into peripheral genes. And so we think that this kind of model can potentially explain why um, core genes that seem to have direct effects on disease um, often contribute so little. Okay, so just to um, wrap up now, um, we propose that gene regulatory networks are sufficiently interconnected, that all of the genes expressed in disease-relevant cells are liable to affect the functions of core disease-related genes, and furthermore, that most of the heritability winds up being due to SNPs that lie outside of core pathways. And, and this hypothesis we refer to as an omnigenic model. Secondly, um, we argue that this model is consistent with what we know about cis and trans EQTLs, where trans variation tends to be responsible for about 70% of the expression heritability, but with tiny effect sizes. And when core genes tend to sit in co-regulated gene networks, um, the modeling suggests that these kind of act as amplifiers for peripheral variation. Um, lastly, just in the last m minute, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our thoughts on, on gene mapping. So in general, I think of gene mapping as serving two main kinds of goals. So the first is genetic prediction. So we'd like to know who's at risk for disease. And for this, it's clear that doing genome-wide association studies is essential um, because you really need to know the, um, the, magnitude, the direction and magnitude of very, very small effect sizes because that's where the bulk of the variance is. And, um, and so we actually need much, much larger GWASs to make this happen. The, the second kind of goal of gene mapping is identification of core genes and pathways that tell us about the biology of a trait, as well as perhaps therapeutics. And, and for this, I think it's actually much more complicated to, to know what the right strategies are going to be. Um, for, for some diseases, particularly in psychiatric sequencing, there's been quite a lot of um, a value already in doing deep exome sequencing to find rare variants or, or deep whole genome sequencing. And I think it's clear that those kinds of efforts should continue. Um, I actually, um, uh, I, I believe that the GWAS uh, will continue to be important for this kind of problem. Um, but I think that it's gonna be really important to develop new methods for learning about cellular networks. And I think that um, understanding the, being able to measure uh, much better what the cellular networks are will enable us to, to interpret the GWAS data to do a better job of inferring from the GWAS data which genes are actually core drivers versus peripheral genes. Um, so, so I imagine that in the, next, uh, in the next few years, we'll have a lot of progress in this space of actually gluing together ne network models um, with GWAS data to, in to interpret the GWAS data better. So I'm going to um, end there, and um, I'm, I mainly want to, to thank, uh, uh, thank the people who, who I've worked with on this project, so Evan Boyle, Yang Li, who, who developed the, uh, um, who, who did uh, all of the hands-on work for the, the first paper, as well as uh, Chun Yao Liu at the University of Chicago, um, who's, who's worked with me a lot on the, uh, the newer work that I described. Um, I'd like to actually particularly thank the PGC for um, many wonderful contributions to complex trait genetics. And of course, we relied on PGC's work to a great extent in the paper we published last year. And, uh, you know, I think that those, those data were extremely helpful for me, at least, in, uh, in thinking about these problems. So I'll end there. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you so much. This was an absolutely spectacular talk. Um, and you actually have sent, you've set the PGC record for attendees. It oh, peaked great. at 110, which is okay. usually on the order of twice of what we usually get. So thank you so much. Well, um, uh, you and I have a, a conversation scheduled uh, in a couple of weeks and I'll ask a number of my questions at that point. Um, but I'd, I'd like to sort of take chair prerogative here and, and ask a sociological question. Um, we actually saw um, immediately after the, this paper came out, that's people got reviews back saying, well, you know, isn't your extremely well designed, you know, and cost effective, you know, new GWAS project, isn't it rendered useless by this, by the omnigenic um, notion? H how would you respond to that? So, um, well, I mean, actually, this, this slide, this slide uh, gets to that. I mean, I, um, so I think that, well, first of all, um, 
Well, for, for, for some traits, it's clear that we care a lot about genetic prediction, and then GWAS is absolutely essential for those. Um, I mean, maybe for, for, for psychiatric traits, it's, it's less clear to me how, how useful genetic prediction is in, is in advance, but uh, you all know more than I do. But I actually think that, um, uh, I actually think that we have an opportunity to, uh, to make a lot of progress on, on understanding complex traits if we can um, get much better at, uh, at learning about how, how regulatory networks work in cells mm -hmm. and sort of plugging that into, into GWAS studies. So, I mean, it seems to, I mean, I think that the, you know, the, the discussion with reviewers is maybe always, always challenging. I mean, this, this field's always had to, uh, you know, argue why it's important, but, you know, I think, I mean, from my point of view, it seems that it would be insane not to not to continue doing these these studies because um, you know they they have been very fruitful and we you know there's clearly a lot more to learn. Um, my my hope is that if we can get much better at at measuring the uh, measuring gene regulatory networks, that we'll be able to actually sort of plug those into GWAS data hmm. and be able to infer. Um, much more directly which, which genes are, uh, are core effects and which genes are peripheral. And so the, there's been quite a lot of work on um, methods that go by names like TWAS, um, which, uh, and, and those, those methods so far have been largely driven by um, cis signals because we don't know very much about trans effects yet. And they tend to be um, one dimensional in the sense that uh, you're basically looking at testing one candidate core gene at a time. And I, what I hope is that in, you know, in five years time, we'll have much better measurement of, of networks and have some thoughts about how to do this. And in that setting, I kind of imagine that, that we could have um, sort of high dimensional analysis of GWAS data where, where you try to um, partition all of the genes into uh, into a small set of core genes and a large set of peripheral genes, and um, and the you know the data are kind of glued together by um, by the by the SNP effect sizes, knowledge of of which SNPs are sysEQTLs for each gene, as well as um, mm. uh, as well as information about network interactions. Um, okay. And so, so we're doing some work with uh, with CRISPR screening approaches to try to um, uh, to to try to have experimental methods for, uh, for inferring uh, weak network interactions. Um, mm -hmm. I, think, um, I, I think that that's a, a promising kind of complement to doing trans-EQTL mapping just because it's, uh, you know, trans-EQTL mapping doesn't scale very well with sample size. Um, yes. uh, so if I could point you to the, the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen, there's three questions that have popped up. And, I will, I, and given that there are some NIMH colleagues on this, I want to point out that Professor Pritchard said it would be, quote, insane, unquote, not to continue to do GWAS. Okay, just wanted to make sure we had that out there. Uh, can you see the questions? If not, I'll read them off to you. Sorry, I'm not seeing them. Uh, can you just read them to me? Sure. Um, actually, if you stop sharing, I'll share my screen. Okay. Actually, uh, I think I can just grab it here. I got it. Ah, thank you. This is the first question from Kyoto uh, Watanabe. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, what's the question? Can you read it there? Uh, I, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? I'm seeing evaluate quality properties. Nope, that's not it. It's, can you read it's it not. For me? Okay, okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, it, the question is. You mentioned that core genes have stronger effects than peripheral genes. So is it correct to think that we, have already, that we already have core genes in the list of associated genes given current sample sizes, but we just don't know which ones? Yes, that is my, that is my belief. Um, I mean, okay, let me, let me clarify. So I think that, um, that so, so when, when we look at, uh, when we look at EQTL variation, um, there are, uh, you know, there, there are many genes with, with very strong EQTLs. There are also many genes that, that have very little cis EQTL variation. So, so if, a, if a core gene has strong 
um, regulatory variants near to it, then I think that those core genes will already be high on our list from, from GWAS that in, in any given GWAS. And, um, and then, then the only question is to be able to figure out which of those core genes, uh, you know, which of the core genes, because there will be some peripheral genes that are mixed in with them. Um, however, there are probably also core genes that don't have, um, don't have strong regulatory variants in, in the cis neighborhood. And so those may actually be far down the list. Um, and, and I think that uh, for those, the, the main way that we'll get those is either by... Um, either through rare variant studies or, um, or if we can get the, the network and our like sort of genome-wide, you know, sort of true genome-wide TWOS kinds of approaches uh, to work well, um, then I think those will be necessary to, to, to find core genes that don't have um, strong transregulatory variants. So there was a second part, but in the interest of time, I'll go to the next question and we'll circle back if we have time. Um, Leah Davis asks, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the implications of your model for genetic epidemiology in contrast to gene mapping, where we are perhaps asking questions about the genetic relationship between phenotypes. Would, do you think that these insights lie mostly in investigating the peripheral genes? Um, so I'm trying to understand the question. Um, it, this, is, this is about thinking about like genetic correlations and what those... I, I, that's my interpretation, yes. Um, yeah, so the way that I'm thinking about genetic correlations now is that um, to, the ex to the extent that um, the core genes for, um, for two traits tend to be uh, somewhere close together in the network, then, then it's probably the case that, that they'll wind up having uh, signals of genetic covariance because, genetic correlation, because um, uh, you know, there will be many trans variants that, that affect them. So, so I think that you know, when, when we're, measuring, when we're me measuring genetic correlations, we're probably measuring something like uh, you know, how, how close together are our core genes in uh, you know, in, in networks. And of course, you know, not all of the core genes have to be close together. If, if even a, uh, a subset of the core genes for, for each of two diseases lie close together in the network, then that, that probably means that they wind up uh, having genetic covariance through the transregulators. Good. Next question is from Alexander Arguello, who asks, isn't the definition of core versus peripheral dependent on variant and trait? For example, a rare mutation in one gene may mean that it's core for an intellectual disability, but a common regulatory variant in the same gene may mean it's peripheral for schizophrenia. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, I completely agree with that. Yeah, so, 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 so the definition of coreness um, de totally depend, completely depends on, uh, on, on which trait you're looking at. Next question from an anonymous, anonymous attendee. One area of the PGC grant, PGC3 grant, the current grant that we have, is seeking to link genetic variation to drug discovery. How does that fit into the omnigenic framework? If the core genes slash pathways are not the major players, does that limit our potential, our potential druggable targets? Um, okay, so, so in... Uh... So, so, so in the way that I think about this, the, the core genes and pathways are, are the, you know, those are the genes that have direct effects on the, um, uh, on the disease. And so if you can, if you can hit those, as, if, you can, if you can make major manipulations of those with drugs, then, um, you know, at least within the model, you can have, potentially have a major effect on the disease. So the, um, the distinction between, between a drug and, um, uh, and variation is that uh, the you know the, the, the trans variation tends to have um, you know like across across many many hundreds of genes it tends to have uh, a, a relatively large cumulative effect. But if you can have a drug that that has a major effect on on one core gene, then that could be a much more important effect than all the trans regulators together. Um, and I, th I think that that's, you know that that kind of thing is clearly the case with um, drugs that, that target uh, genes like PCSK. PS, PCSK9 for, uh, for lipids. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. Silvio Bacano asks, 
For now, looking marginally, i.e. at the most enriched pathways, would get us the core genes, isn't it? Um, the low-hanging fruit before trying to model 20K by 20K gene-gene interactions. Yes, I mean, I, I agree with that. So I think it's, it's clear that they, um, like it's much easier for a, a core gene to have a large effect. Um, and, and so when, when, we look at the, when we look at the genes at the top of the list, um, from, from GWAS, those will be highly enriched for core genes. And I think the gene set enrichment analysis shows that. And, and also experiments where people have, have taken um, very top hits from diseases like FTO and, and C4 and, and, and shown direct links. Um, but I think it's the, you know, the, the model suggests that there should be many more um, core genes that don't get to the top of the list simply because they don't happen to have um, CCQTLs. In fact, I mean, you know, core genes may often be under stronger purifying selection and, and thereby, you know, less likely to have strong regulatory variants. So, um, you know, there, I think there probably is still, a, you know, a significant number of, uh, of important core genes to, to be found. Thank you. So I actually and, can see the questions now, so. Oh, good. So the other one is from the Kyoko Watanabe. Yep. The, is, she, uh, you answered the first part. Okay. So perhaps you could do the second. Sure. Um, so based on the network figure showed, I can see that core genes form dense sub-networks and have edges with many hundreds of peripheral genes. Uh, I can imagine if you have hundreds of associated genes, you end up with many dense sub-networks. How do you distinguish sub-network of peripheral genes from actual core genes? Um, so the way that I've, so, so in the, um, in the more formal modeling that we've done, um, the way that I think about core genes there is, is that I, um, I imagine that you have a, uh, you have, you, you have a set of M core genes and, um, and, those, and then the expression levels of those have direct effects on, on the disease. And then there are peripheral genes and, and the expression levels of the peripheral genes matter, but it only matters, through, it only matters indirectly through their effects on core genes. So that, um, uh, you know, if, if like, Conceptually, if, if we knew, if we were told what the expression levels of all the core genes were, then we wouldn't need to know anything about the expression levels of all the peripheral genes because they wouldn't matter anymore. So, um, uh, you know, so that, that's sort of an abstraction of, of all of the complexities of, of, of the network model. Um, and uh, we, we've had a bit of a hard time thinking about how to do, you know, how to uh, sort of really model the you know, full complexities of networks, but I think that that uh, sort of simplified version is, is quite illuminating to us. Um, I'm not sure if that really quite gets to the question, but hopefully it's useful. Very good. Okay, that we're well past time and uh, that closes, that was the last of the questions that we had. Um, I, I'm sure um, all the participants um, who are silent would join me in thanking you with a wondrous round of applause for such a fascinating talk. Jonathan, thank you so much for taking the time um, to speak with us today. And I look forward to talking to you one-on-one -on -one in a couple of weeks. Great. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. That's it, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.